Church, we're pressing forward in our study in the book of Philippians. And I'm going to tell you this morning, the end is in sight. I know we have been in this book, I think, since September, but we've been moving our way slowly through this, really pressing out all the details that we can. But uh, after this morning, we've got two more sermons that should carry us, Lord willing, through the end of this letter. And from here, I'll just give you a little preview. We're going to move on from Philippians into a short series in Matthew chapter 6 about uh, the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to talk about the theology of prayer and what it means to communicate with God and so that's kind of what's, what's coming up here in the next, in the next few weeks. But I'm going to have you open your Bibles, if you will. But let's do this. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 8 and 9. I'm going to give you some time to go there. We're going to go on a little journey through these two verses, through our text today, and then also as it applies to our Christian life as a whole. We're going to look through this journey of faith that we've been going through. And I want to tell you a little story as you're looking in your copy of God's Word uh, for uh, Philippians chapter 4. There's one thing that you know about me that I am very, very bad at. And you know it by now. I've told you many, many times, but there's, I mean, there's many things I'm bad at. But one of the key things is directions. You know me by now. I I get lost everywhere I go. I have a terrible sense of direction. And so we were driving one day. My, my family had gone to Waco to spend time with family, uh, for, with Mindy's family for a week. And I was back in New Mexico. And so I was driving to pick them up a little bit later. And I, I had driven the whole way. If you've driven from like Amarillo to, to DFW, you know it's the most boring drive in the history of the world. There's nothing there. So I was driving all the way across and I, I get into the Metroplex. Now, you, you have to understand some things. This is nightmare scenario for me. Driving in Dallas, Matthew, I do not know how you do that. Like every other day you're driving through that. That just, uh, and, and Mark, I mean, literally navigating the streets of Dallas. I, I don't know how you, how you were ever able to do that. It is a nightmare scenario. I, I approach it and I'm, I'm praying for at least an hour before I hit the Metroplex. I'm like, Lord, please. Just my, my blood pressure's already rising. My anxiety is going up. I start to get in and it starts to get real trafficy. And my GPS immediately is wrong. Because there's so much construction, it's, it, it's looking, and they're like, get back on the road. I'm like, I'm on the road. It's just all wrong. So I turn my GPS off, and I, think, I say, I think I can figure this out. I think I, I know where I'm going. I'm looking for 35. That's, it's, the, it's the biggest road there. It's like, I think I can figure this out. And I'm driving, and it's almost like, and I'm probably exaggerating, but this is how I feel. It's almost like I've accidentally entered into like a NASCAR speedway. Because people are driving, and there's 400,000 roads, and people are driving 75 miles an hour, and they're weaving in and out of traffic, and I'm just sitting there. I mean, my chest is pressed up against the, the steering wheel. I'm just trying to make it. And, and finally, I see 35, and I'm like, oh, oh. So, okay. I exit, I get where I'm supposed to go, and I'm driving. It's, it's like, okay, that wasn't as bad as I, as I pictured it would be. And so I'm driving, and I'm looking for signs for Waco. That's how I know, hey, this is how long I have to go, and I'm driving. I'm just not seeing those signs. And so I'm driving, I'm driving, I drive through Denton, and, and I keep going. <laughs> you laugh, because you know. I didn't know. I'm looking for signs for Waco, and then I'm seeing signs for Gainesville, and I keep driving. <laughs> and eventually I hit the Oklahoma state line. <laughs> That's the moment when I realize I, I, don't think I'm, I don't think I'm where I'm supposed to be. And so I stopped, and I was like, I don't, I don't think I'm supposed to be in Oklahoma, I don't... I don't know the Texas map at that point real well, but I, I don't think I'm there. So Mindy called me and she's like, are you almost here? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm as far away as it's possible to be at this point. I had gone obviously in the wrong direction on 35 and I went 60 miles out of my way. I had to turn around and I had to make that trip again. And I had to drive through the Metroplex again to get to where I was going. But here's the thing, I tell you this story, not to make you feel sorry for me, but I tell you this story because I think in our Christian lives, this is, this is the way people try to navigate through their Christian life. Because what did I, I, I miss? I missed the signs. I missed the signs that told me where I was supposed to go. I missed clearly marked exits. I missed everything that I was supposed to see. And I think this is the way a lot of Christians navigate their spiritual lives. They look at, at things like church and they say, well, I don't need the church. I can figure this out on my own. Or they say, I don't, I, don't, I don't need a mentor. I don't need to be discipled. I can, I can figure this out. I can do this on my own. Or they look at even scripture and they can say, well, I don't need to read the Old Testament. I don't, I don't need to read all that stuff. I don't need to do the reading plans. I don't need to do this. I can handle this. I don't need someone telling me what to do. It's like we believe it's a badge of honor to be self-sufficient. And what happens more often than not in our Christian lives, we're headed in the wrong directions. 
And when you don't have the church and you don't have a discipler and you're not in scripture consistently, you're missing all the signs telling you you're going in the wrong direction. And so this morning, what I want to do is look at Philippians chapter four, verses eight and nine. I want to take a journey through them. And what we're going to see in verse eight is a list of eight different qualities or characteristics, eight different qualities or characteristics. How many list people do I have this morning? Like you just love a good list. You live your life by lists. Man, I love you all. You're my people. I love, and, and this is just a perfect storm, when you can put a list in a spreadsheet. Oh, man, that, that's, that, oh, it's just, it just makes my heart so happy when you can see a good list. I love crossing off a list. Oh, as you go through and you check it off. Mindy and I talk about this. Sometimes at the end of the day, that's when we'll write our lists because then you can write all the things you've already done and you can check it off and say, look how productive that I was. But as you look at this list of eight qualities, what I want to look at and consider this morning is that these are road signs on a journey of faith. So as you see these signs appear in your life, you know, you know you're going in the right direction. So I'm going to look at this. Let's look at verses 8 and 9, Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Let's stand together to give honor to the reading of God's word. As any good preacher, Paul is going to start this section in verse 8 by saying, Finally, or you've heard many pastors say, in conclusion, and he's not done yet. He's not anywhere near being done yet. He's still got uh, uh, quite a bit to go, but he's going to start with this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, and if there is anything praiseworthy, Dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be in you, be with you. God bless the reading of his word. Let's go to him in prayer this morning and let's explore these two verses. Father, we come before you again and we recognize your sovereignty and your greatness. We recognize that these words are your heart communicated to your people. We thank you so much, Lord, that we are not left alone in this world, but we have so many blessings that you've poured out on us. We have the blessing, first and foremost, of, of the gospel message, that it, it shows us how to pass from death to life, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of your dear son. I thank you, Lord, for the gospel message that we, re, we exult in and we praise you for this morning. I also thank you for your word that is your heart communicated for us. We thank you that it is, Lord, a roadmap to life, that it explains who you are and what you desire from your people. And so we praise you this morning for your word. We thank you for the church. We thank you, Lord, that it is your body in this world, that is your vehicle for gospel advance and kingdom advance in this world. We thank you for the church as your hands and feet in this world. Lord, we, you've poured out so many blessings on us, and we thank you that you did not leave us alone. We praise you as well, Lord, for the Holy Spirit that dwells inside us, that, that gives us witness and testimony with other believers and also points us to our own sin and the righteousness that is in Christ Jesus. We praise you for these eight qualities that you desire to see in your church, and we pray, Lord, that as we explore these, that these would become more and more evident as you're sanctifying your people. We love you and we thank you. We praise you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Number one, as we, as we walk through this list of eight things, is this road signs on the journey. That's how we're going to start. Number one is this road signs on the journey. You can look at these like eight road signs. Now, I missed all of the signs that I was supposed to be seeing when I was driving through the Metroplex, but I want to look at this in terms of our Christian life. When you see these things, you know you're headed in the right direction. True, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and praiseworthy. These are the signs that you should be looking for in your Christian life. When you see these, you know you're headed in the right direction. But here's what I want to do this morning. I'm going to, it's, it's going to look a little different. What I want to do is I want to walk through each of these eight qualities, and I want to just describe them. I want to just go through and see what they actually mean. And then at the end, we're going to spend some time applying them to our life. But first, we need to understand what they are. So let's look at this in verse 8. It says, uh, it says here, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is, what's the first one? Whatever is true. 
Whatever is true. We have to start here. If you don't start with truth, nothing else is going to make sense. And I think this is where a lot of people in, in, in Christianity, in modern Christianity, they want all the blessings and all the benefits, and they want all the things that God promises in his word, but they're wanting to compromise the truth. They're wanting to look at the truth and say, well, I, I don't want any part of that. That's too exclusive. That, that truth is too, it's too much, it doesn't include everybody, it's not diverse enough. And so they look at the truth and they say, well, I'm going I'm, I'm I'm to ignore the truth, but I want all the other benefits. You can't. If you miss this road sign in faith you're, you're, of truth, you're going to miss everything after. It's the Greek word alethes, and it means true. True means true. It's not hard. This is a very simple one. It's used to describe something that is unhidden, that is something very plain, very visible. If, it's, if in the middle of the night, I don't know if you've, you've tried to make your way through your house, I swear, in the middle of the night, Mindy has gotten up at several times and rearranged furniture. And I think the kids have taken all their toys and, and made a path all the way through where they know people are going to walk. And so you're walking through, and you're like, ah, she's stepping on each thing. And, but what happens when you turn on the light? Then you're like, oh, well, that's where everything is. That's what I'm thinking. That's, that's what this word true. It's the light's on. Everything is visible. Everything is right out in the open. I want you to hear this. You should never have to work hard to find the truth of the gospel in the local church. It should never be a thing where you're looking through a church service and saying, was the, was the gospel there? Was did he mention Jesus? But church, how many times do you watch preachers on TV or on the internet and you go through an entire message, you know, like, he didn't even say the name of Jesus. He didn't mention the gospel message. Listen, if you're visiting with us and you're part of a church that you have to work hard to find the truth of the gospel, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. You got to run. You got to get out of that church and find a church that is committed to not watering down or not ignoring the truth of the gospel. Ultimate truth is found where, church? In the word of God, but specifically in whom? In Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way to salvation. Truth is foundational to everything else. If you miss truth, if you compromise on truth, if you water down truth, then nothing else in this list, you're never going to see any of these other signs. You can't go in the right direction without first going through Jesus Christ. You're not going to see what's pure and just and excellent if you don't all... all if you don't first seek what's true. So the truth is where we start. The second one is honorable, honorable. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable. This, this word semnos in the Greek, it means venerable or, or grave or serious or reverent. And it comes from the root word, which we get our, our, our term devout. And so this is an idea of where we would look at being religiously devout. When the Holy Spirit awakens a person's heart to the truth, and their mind to understand and to know Jesus Christ, it will lead them to being devout. It will lead them to being devoted followers of Jesus Christ. There's no indication in the New Testament. All right, let's, let's just talk plainly on the surface. There is no indication in the New Testament of a person who comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ who is also not a devout person believer, a devout disciple, or somebody pursuing Jesus. We, we have turned Christianity in, in our modern culture into a decision that you make, and you pray a prayer, and you're saved, and then you can just live your life with added hell insurance. But the truth is, when you look through the New Testament, the, the idea of a believer is, I am, I'm, 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 forsaking my life before I'm looking back on my sin and my self-righteousness and I'm letting that go and I'm trusting fully in, in, in the work and the person of Jesus Christ and it become, we become devoted followers of Jesus Christ. You don't see a generation of people who are just casual church attenders. Can you imagine what would have happened in the book of Acts had the people who came to saving faith in Christ just said, you know what, sports are more important or, or this is more important or uh, there's, a, there's an important game on later so I need to watch that or we don't see that we see a people who are completely devoted to the, the Christ the Savior that they serve so this this word honorable it means reverence and and a pursuit and a devoutness about our devotion to Jesus the third word here I'm going to keep moving quick because I want to get through all eight of these and I want to see what each of them mean the third word here is the word just in Greek it's the word dikaios and it means innocent, holy, righteous, guiltless, and acceptable. This morning, answer me a question, if you're brave. Are you innocent, holy, righteous, guiltless, and acceptable? Are you? 
Ross, you, you're pretty sure you're not. Okay. Help me out here. Come up here. Okay. So if I said, are, are, you, are you righteous? Are you innocent? You'd say, no. Why? Because we're sinners, okay? So you, you're, we're born this way. We're born into our sin, okay? And, and, and that's a true statement of our life apart from Christ, right? You are not. You are not innocent. You're not innocent. I'm not innocent. I'm not guiltless. I'm not acceptable in the sight of God. But what happened when you came to saving faith in Jesus? What happened to you? I put him on the spot. That's, that's a tough thing. You're in front of everybody. Okay, we're still sinners in the sense that we're, we're still in a corrupted body, but Jesus did something for you. What did he do for you? He saved us from our sins. Great. Yes, he gave us a pathway to God. That's fantastic. So he looked at you as a sinner and he said, I, I, I want you to be my son. I, my, I want you to be my the joint heirs with Christ. He said, I want, I want you to, to receive my grace and mercy when you did that. Now God looks at you and does he see your sin? No, he doesn't. God looks at you. If you are in Christ, then what does he see? He sees Jesus in you. So he looks at you, and now answer me this question. In Christ, in Christ, and through what he did, did for you, are you innocent, holy, righteous, guiltless, and acceptable? Yes. yes. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Yes, good job. Thank you for participating. Not many people would just jump up and do that. But seriously, we look at this and we understand who we are before Christ and apart from Christ. We are not innocent. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But when you come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, God looks at you and what he sees is the blood of Christ covering your sin, atoning for your sin. And he says that person has been justified. So when we see this word just, dikaios in Greek, this is the story of the gospel. We aren't these things, but in Christ Jesus, sinners are just. They are justified by his grace and declared righteous. So when you see this neon sign, this, this, this road sign, it's pointing us to the gospel. It's pointing us to the, the just justification that we have in Jesus Christ. Let's keep moving. Number four is this pure, whatever is pure. Pure. This is the practical side of the word just. So when you look at the word just, that is who we are in Christ Jesus. But this word pure is how we live in Christ Jesus. It's the word hagnos, and it means clean and modest and chaste and holy. And again, we can't achieve this on our own. That Ross, you, you, can't, you can't say, I'm going to do enough good, and then God is going gonna, is gonna to be pleased with me, and, and that's what's making me holy. No, the truth is God makes you holy through the blood of Jesus, and then we live pure lives in response to his grace and his mercy. Number five, as we move on, it's this word lovely. The word lovely. In Greek, it's this word prosphiles. It, it, isn't that just a lovely word, prosphiles? It sounds like, it just, I don't know, just, it makes me sound very fancy to say prosphiles. It means friendly or acceptable or pleasing. Picture with me for a second. Close your eyes for a second. Picture the, the most peaceful place that you could ever imagine. Are you there? Okay. What do you see? Where is it? Church. Oh, you don't get any brownie points for that, Colt. Like, I appreciate it, but it's not it. Mindy, where is your most peaceful place? Yeah, where is it, though? Yeah, so Mindy has a years-long obsession with Ireland. And uh, I wanted to earn myself some brownie points, so I found a picture I believe is the most peaceful place that I've ever seen in my life. This is the, the Irish village of Bibbery, and I guarantee you, if Mindy ever went here, you would lose your pianist because she would never come back. She would look and say, no, this is it, I'm sorry, I'm moving here. But is it, I mean, th to me, what a, what a beautiful place picturesque place. Just imagine walking down this lane and just the beauty and the loveliness of it all. So this word lovely, that's what it means, friendly, acceptable, and pleasing. This is a physical representation of what life looks like in Christ Jesus. It's beautiful. It's gentle. It's pleasing. It's lovely. The sixth word here, let's move on, 
is this word commendable. So he's making this list. We're at here, number six, commendable. Eophemos in the Greek, and it means uh, a reputable or of good report or, or well spoken of. You, you, we don't use this word commendable very often, but we do use a, a word that comes from this, and that's the word recommend. So when you go to uh, a restaurant and you had the best dinner you've ever had, what's the first thing that a lot of us do? We got to recommend it. I got to get on Facebook. Hey, you've got to go here. Or you write someone, you say, you've got to, I, I recommend that you go to this place. That's what this is well spoken of. The justified person, the person that's in Christ should live a life that is well spoken of. That people look and they cannot, the world cannot throw an accusation against the believer and have it stick because we have a reputation. That's what this, this word means, commendable, reputable. The seventh thing as we move down this list, whatever, or if there is any moral excellence. Your version may say something different. What does yours say? Virtue. Good, that's, that's one. And, and some people, yours may just say excellence in general, okay? You, you can maybe translate it this way when you think of this word moral excellence, living and doing what's right in the eyes of God. Living and doing what's right in the eyes of God. It's this Greek word arete, which, which means all of these things, excellence, virtue, morality. As you travel on your journey of faith, church, your life should be set apart. It should look different. We shouldn't look like the world. Nobody should have to look at your life and, and try to find intricate details about how you are different. The way that you talk and think and act and decide and react and your attitude, all of these things should look differently than what this world, what this world looks like. Can, I guess the question could be is this, can people see that difference in you? Can they see that there's something different, that there's a, a different... Um, operational standard, that there's a different worldview, that there's something different that you're pursuing than what this world looks at. The last thing is this, number eight, is praiseworthy. It's, it's a very similar word to moral excellence. It, it, it means, uh, the, the word epinos, it means laudable or commendable or, or praiseworthy. There's a different uh, focus in this word, though, because, again, the believer's life should bring praise to the name of the Lord. Okay, so we've walked through, that's a, that's a flyby of these eight words. We probably could have spent a sermon on each word, but I do want to finish Philippians at some point in the near future. But this, this is kind of like a flyby, 30,000 feet, let's look. You're, you're driving, you're quickly seeing all of these signs and what they mean. And it, you may be sitting here this morning, and you may be a little uncomfortable. You may be sitting here saying, I appreciate all that, but that's not what my life looks like. Maybe we're sitting here like, ah, well, you, you look at this list, true and honorable and just and pure and commendable and praiseworthy, and all of these things. I, like, that's, that's not me. I'm struggling to just be here on a Sunday morning. I don't raise your hands, but man, I, if you're raising kids, how hard is it to, just, to, just to get your kids up and be here? Uh, when I got home this morning, so I came in early and was praying and studying, and I, I went home uh, to help get the girls ready, and Sophie was sitting on the couch, and she just had this rotten look on her face. She was just, so I was like, Sophie, what's wrong? And she's like, Mama is mean. And so I said, well, what, 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 is, what does she mean about what happened? She said, she woke me up. I was like, okay, I understand. But so sometimes it's, sometimes you feel like I'm, I'm just making it. I'm here. How, how many times have you said that? Like when you walk up to someone, hey, how are you doing? I'm here. Like this is baseline. I'm, I'm here. I exist. I'm breathing. We're functioning. We're here. Uh, there's not very many people who come to church that, that are just like, man, I just conquered the day already. I'm just, this is amazing. So, so sometimes we look at our life and we think, eh, I'm, just, I'm just making it. And you look at other people in the church sometimes, and you think they've got it way more, they're so much further along in this journey. They're, they've got things put together. They've got the answers. And I, I don't even know, I open God's word sometimes, and I don't even know what it means. And, and I'm trying to figure this out, and I'm trying to do what's right, and I'm, I'm trying to figure these things out, and I just don't know. So we can look at a, a passage like this, and we can say, and I am not measuring up. These eight things, I, I, I'm nowhere near. I'm nowhere near being lovely in my Christian life. I don't feel pure. I, I don't feel these things. I, I, I want to give you some encouragement this morning. I don't want you to feel discouraged about this. If you would have come to me and said, yep, that's me. Those eight things describe me to a T. Might as well put my name in the Bible right next to, a, a, you know, right next to these things. Then I'd be a little concerned. I want to look at this, and, and we understand that this is not a list that, that Christians are commanded to live perfectly at all times. 
This isn't, this isn't this list that if you're not measuring up to this, then you failed in your Christian life. That's not what this is about. Hear me out. This is a description of Jesus. The beauty and the grace and the purity and the righteousness that is only found in Jesus Christ. So don't, hear, don't sit here this morning and say, I'm never going to measure up to that standard. Well, of course we can't. This, this is describing Jesus. These are road signs on the way to a destination. The destination is not perfection. There's not going to be a moment in your life where you stop and you say, I'm there. I arrived. I'm perfect. Everybody else is beneath me. There's never a moment. We're going to see Jesus face to face in glory, and that is the destination. It's not heaven. It's not the streets of gold. It's not the, 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 the loss of the curse and, and the beauty that comes with it. The destination is the presence of Jesus. He says in Revelation chapter 22, I will be among them. I will be their people. Or they will be my people and I will be their God. So when we look at this, Paul says in chapter three, he says, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the goal. So these eight signs, these qualities, they're road signs pointing us to our destination. Each of them describe who Jesus is. Now, here's my question, though, as we, as we kind of walk through the end of this. Should these qualities be present in our lives? Absolutely. I'm not giving anybody an out. Like, oh, I don't have to be pure or just or lovely because Jesus was for me. Granted, he, he did this for you and he accomplished this for you in salvation, but this is what the life that he's calling us to live and so to the degree that we're being sanctified, these things should be present in our lives. We should be seeking them and working toward them and striving toward this kind of holy and obedient life while keeping our eyes on Jesus. That's going to lead us to number two. So the road signs were number one. Number two, what do we do with this? As a believer today, what, what am I supposed to do? If I, if maybe, maybe I don't exhibit this list. What do I do with this now? Paul gives us the answer at the end of verse eight and the beginning of verse nine. And number two is this, instructions for the journey. The end of verse eight, after he gives this list, what is his instruction? Dwell on these things. Your version may say, think about these things. And then in verse nine, what's the first word? Do it. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me. So what are we supposed to do with these road signs? Dwell and do. Dwell and do, that's the Christian life in two words. Dwell and do. Dwell is a really interesting word in the Greek. It means a lot of different things, but it, its primary usage in this text is to meditate on something, to think about something, to take inventory, to reason about something, or to, 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 to put your mind on something. So Paul is saying, these things that you see, these eight road signs that are pointing us to Jesus Christ, think about him. Fill your mind with him. Occupy your meditation with Christ. Spurgeon gave a, an incredible sermon one Sunday. And one of the things that he said is he didn't believe that in his congregation there were very many people who could sit in a room alone and think about Jesus for five minutes without being distracted. I mean, that, that hit me like a ton of bricks. Could I sit in a room by myself and think about my Savior for five minutes without being distracted? This is what Paul says. He's saying, listen, dwell on this. Don't pass by. Don't move in and then move out. Dwell on it. Sit on these things and think about them and chew on them and think about who Christ is. Dwell on him. He told the church at Colossae to let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. But it has to, you can't stop there, church. I think there's a lot of people who have a lot of head knowledge and they can, they can, they, they, they're very cerebral and they can think about these things, but it doesn't lead them to do anything. That's why Paul follows dwelling up with what? Doing. Dwelling should always lead to doing. The more you learn about Christ, the more it should lead you to walk in obedience to him. Our lives should reflect the character of the Savior that we serve. So he says, do it. Do what you have received. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. He says, do these things. You've received them and heard them and seen them. So pursue Jesus. Think about him and what he has done and what he's accomplished and who he is. And, and then pursue him. Our lives should reflect the character of the Savior that we serve. So back in chapter 3, just going to kind of rewind a little bit, put this all in context. Paul gave us another list. Do you remember that list? He had talked about who he was before Christ. Tell me some of the things that he put on that list. What was he really proud of in chapter 3? He was really proud of a couple of things. His, his Jewish heritage was one. He says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was a tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day. Like He was proud of his heritage. What else was he proud of? 
Being a Pharisee, his training, his religious training, is that I was, I was trained by the Pharisee. I was trained by the best schools of the Pharisees. What else was he proud of? Persecuting the church. This is in my zeal. I was doing what I felt like God wanted me to do. He, he, he also was proud of the fact that he was, as the law, as, if the law could give righteousness, he says, I was morally righteous. I followed all the law. So he gives us this list, and then when he comes to faith in Christ, what is his conclusion about that list? It's worthless. All the things that I thought were important are now worthless, but now he gives us a different list, and he says this, this is the life I want in Christ Jesus. That was my life before, and I thought it was important, but this is the life that I want now. I want to be true and just and pure, and I want, I want to be commendable. I want my life to look like these things, loveliness and, and being praiseworthy. He said, I want, I want this for myself. He wanted this for this dear church, these saints that he loved and through Christ Jesus, what God desires for you, church, this morning is your sanctification. Sanctification means to become more like Christ Jesus, and that's what this list is going to look like. So you may be sitting here this morning and think, my life does not look like these eight things, but that's, that's the process. As you go through, as you follow Christ, as you endure with him, as you engage with him, as you follow him along this path, your life is going to look more and more like him each and every day. Our lives should reflect the character of the Savior that we serve. So that, that's my question. I'm going to just finish with a couple of uh, thoughts here. A am I filling myself up with what is true and honorable and just? Where are you spending your time? What, 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 are, you, what are you putting into your head? What, what are the things that you're occupying your time? Mindy and I were thinking about it yesterday, the fact that before we had kids and we had time for life, we, we would, uh, this was before like streaming stuff on the internet, like we would, we would rent DVDs from like Blockbuster or whatever and we would watch through. And I think, man, we watched through Friends and Seinfeld and some of those like over and over and over and over. I look back on that now, I'm like, man, that was a lot of time that we spent putting stuff in our heads, right? And we, we do this all the time. You can start scrolling on Facebook and then look up and it's like 1.30 in the morning. You're like, oh, I didn't do anything worthwhile in the last four hours, Church, stop for a moment and just, just think about that. Am I filling myself up? Am I meditating? Am I dwelling on what is true and honorable and just and pure and lovely, commendable? Am I walking in obedience to Jesus? Is it leading me to follow him and pursue him more? And I want you to see this. These eight qualities, you're going to see them in every sphere of your life. You're going to see God working in every moment. You're going to see him working in your family, in your home, at work. You're going to see him in all these places. But I want to encourage you and challenge you with this. These eight qualities are most easily and obviously seen in the church. These eight things, these, this being true and honorable and just and pure, and all these things, it is most clearly evident in the gathered body of Christ. So if you're walking in your journey and you think, I can do this without the church, I can do this outside. I can do this apart from the church. Man, you, you're going to miss the road signs. The church was designed, you were designed to function inside the local body of believers. So think about those things. If you want to see these qualities in your life, if you want to pursue them, you want to pursue Jesus through them, it's going to happen here first. Third thing, and I am done, I've said that four times, is this, the destination of the journey. Where are we trying to get? Am I trying to get a perfect church? Am I trying to get... A bunch of perfect people who just perfectly live in perfection. Is that the goal? Is perfection the goal? It can't be. We know we can't be. The goal is the presence of Jesus. The goal is Jesus at the end of all things. So look how he ends this in verse 9. So do what you've heard and learned and received from me and seen in me. And then what does it say? The God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. Now in this context, he's talking about God will be with you on the journey. He's, he's, he's promised to never leave us or forsake us. He has promised to walk with us. He, he, when you walk through this journey and you think, I don't know how to do this, well, Jesus is with you. The God of peace will be with you, giving you peace. But there's also a bigger, a bigger promise here is that at the end of all things, God will physically be with you. That's the prize. That's the goal. At the end of all things, every, every moment you have struggled and suffered and endured, we will have the presence of Jesus for all eternity. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Dwell on him. Walk in obedience to him. One day, church, we're all going to re reach this destination together. I'm going to ask our praise team to come up, lead us in a song of invitation. Church, I want you to very, very clearly hear this message this morning. After everything I've said, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I'm going to call you and I'm going to invite you.
to come and receive Jesus as your Savior today. We can, we can learn all these things, and we can, we can want all the, the blessings and the benefits of Christianity, but it starts here with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You and I are sinners separated from God because of our sin, but Jesus came and lived the sinless life we could never live and died the substitutionary death that we deserved. He died in our place. He literally looked at me and said, you will never be able to measure up, so I am going to live in your place and die for you so that when you repent of your sins and trust in me, you will be saved. Church, the message is so simple. A child can receive it. In fact, Jesus said, if you don't receive the kingdom of heaven like a child, innocent and, 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 and believing and trusting with your heart, then you can't receive it at all. This morning, trust in Jesus. You can't save yourself. You can't do it. You can't be true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable. You can't be those things in your own power. It is only through Jesus. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I beg you, week by week by week, repent of your sins and trust in the name of Jesus for your salvation. And he promises if you come to him in faith, he will save you. So I'm going to give you that opportunity. We're going to sing. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, please come talk to me. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you up in front of all these people. We're going to sit here on the front row, and I'm going to explain through Scripture what it means to be saved. If you need to make a decision for Christ this morning, if you need to pray, of course, the altar is open. If God's leading you uh, to, to join the church, this is a great time to uh, indicate that desire. So uh, respond. Whatever that looks like in your life this morning, respond. If it's in praise, it's in praise. If it's in a decision, I would love to help you through that process. Father, we love you. And we thank you that in Christ Jesus, we are righteous. <laughs> Lord, I know who I am, and I don't deserve that gift of righteousness, but you, you poured it out so freely on me. And I, I praise you. I praise you that, that the gospel message reminds us that you are altogether good, pure and true, lovely, praiseworthy, and just. And that if we are in you, if we are joined with you in salvation, that... that you, you are transforming us into your own image. The Holy Spirit is working in our hearts to cut what shouldn't be and planting what should be, and it looks like this. I pray, Lord, that we would see those signs in our own lives, that we would understand that we're, we're on this journey, not, not to discourage us because we're, we're not very far along in the journey, but to encourage us that we are making progress through your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, for this church, and I pray that if somebody in this room does not know you as their Savior, that today they would repent of their sins and believe in Jesus for their salvation. I pray that you would take someone and transform them from death to life, that you would draw them in with your cords of love and remind them that you love them, that you want to save them this morning. Father, we pray as we enter in this time of response that we would lift our hearts to you in praise, that we would deal with the things that we need to deal with in our own hearts. We love you with them. Thank you.